does fifteen hundred dollars worth of renovations and puts a renter in there for fifteen hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. That was six years ago. He's still collecting rent on that property. Wow. Yep. I know you want to make more money. Having the right real estate attorney can make that a lot easier. In this video, you're going to have an opportunity to listen to me interview an attorney that I'm going to be working with, and he's going to discuss tax liens, subject tos, transactional funding, and a lot more. So you know what you need to do. You need to simply stand by. Let's get it. Text me and I'll text you back. Text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. Tick tock, you don't stop. I will help you make your paper stack. Where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Where you at now? 205 Hello guys, this is Ty A.K. The Flip Man. And this is a very special day because we have a uh, a legal mind on the real estate side, side of the business that's going to uh, share some of his valuable, valuable knowledge and experience. And one thing is going to be very unique and that you'll see is that um, not only is he a real estate attorney, he's an attorney that thinks creatively, obviously within the law, to make deals happen. So we have uh, attorney Greg Stanley here, which is a uh, local attorney here in Alabama. It's amazing. I've been doing this almost 20 years and... Uh, his name just start just kept coming up after me doing my research on uh, tax deed properties over the last almost three weeks, and so uh, I'm fortunate enough to reach out to him, and uh, here here we are. Uh, how's it going, uh, Greg? It's nice, great. I'm really glad to be on your show. Thanks for for asking me. <clears throat> uh, no problem at all. I'm glad you was able to uh, share your time with us. Um, so uh, we'll just go ahead and get right into it, Greg. If um, if you could just give us a little um uh i guess a little history on uh your practice maybe how you end up ended up in this particular niche of number one law and then real estate law or whatever so as you know providing advice closing and so on uh well yeah that's actually uh, i think it's an interesting story i hope you do too so i was active duty air force and for 24 years <clears throat> wow and okay and when I got ready to retire, um, I thought, well, um, now I get to do something that I've always wanted to do, which is go to law school. So um, a year before I retired, I started going to law school at night at the Birmingham School of Law and um, just found out I really liked it. Never really intended to be a, um, a lawyer. I had always I had been investing in property for about 20 years. Uh, a lot of it with my father-in-law, we had done some developments and we had done some just buys and flips and uh, buy and hold as a vacation home, you know, lots of those sorts of things. And uh, and I got into tax liens down in Baldwin County in uh, Daphne. <clears throat> uh, I was able to get a bunch of lots in uh, Lake Forest subdivision okay. and uh, realized that uh, I, I was really enjoying doing that. And so I wound up needing to quiet the title on all those. Well, since I owned them in my own name and, and I didn't really have, you know, any other ideas how to do it, um, I went ahead and paid a lawyer down there in Daphne to do some of the quiet titles for me. But then when I became a lawyer, I started doing my own quiet titles and my own ejectments and my own letters and, you know, all those things. And um, then what, I, what was interesting to me was Turned out that there's not many people, not many attorneys in Alabama who do um, work with, with uh, tax liens, and that was my that was my area was tax liens. And okay. so uh, a friend of mine, well, he wasn't a friend at the time. We both showed up at this cottage in Crestwood. We both wanted to buy the taxes on it, and it turns out that he too was a lawyer, but he worked for a big firm downtown, and and uh, so he he started asking me to do things for him in in. You know, next thing I know, I've got I've got clients, and I had to set up a trust account, and you know, you know, uh, the uh, whenever clients in Alabama pay you, the money has to go into a trust account, and then you get paid out of that. So I had to set right. that up, and never intended on that. And the next thing I know, I've got an office in Irondale, 
Uh, and now I got three attorneys and three paralegals working for me. So oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't intend that to happen. We've got our own uh, closing shop. Uh, Attorney Scruggs runs, does all of our closings. And we started off doing cash closings and sub twos and reps and, you know, all those sorts of things and providing the paperwork for, for people in Alabama and doing um, uh, one of the things that I found when I first got into tax liens was that. Boom. Was so if you're looking to make money with tax liens, I have a tool for you that can make that a lot easier. All you have to do is follow the instructions on the screen now or tap the link in the description of this video and you will thank me later. Now back to the video. There's a lot of wholesalers out there, but there's a lot of scammers out there as well. And what mm -hmm. the scammers will do is they'll sell you something that they don't own. Mm -hmm. And um, it's pretty bad. You know, we've got people out there who are doing writing their own deeds and that's against the law. Then we've got people out there who are notarizing things and they're not notaries. You know, wow. and, and you're thinking that you're buying this piece of property. But in fact, no, that's that's not at all what's happening. What's happening is you, you, all you bought was a lawsuit, you know, so now you can go sue that guy who sold it to you. So that's how I got here was uh, just people started asking me to do this stuff. And pretty soon I had an office. How, how long how long have you been doing it? Uh, I know you uh, did the, the uh, attorney side of it. I know you've been investing a long time, but how long have you been doing it? I, I've been investing for 20 or well now 20. Wow. Gosh, now I'm, I'm old. I had no idea. So I've been investing for about 30 years, but I've been uh, an attorney doing this for 12 in Alabama. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Okay. So um, uh, part of this is going to be on the tax lien stuff. Then we'll get into some of the other uh, methods of, um, you know, doing transactions or whatever creative ways. Um, okay. So now each state is different. So let's preference that. So Greg, Greg is an is an expert here in Alabama, so that's preference test. But I'm sure in any state there's going to be a similar attorney that probably does the same thing. Now, how you find that person, we'll get into that um, also. So, um, so, uh, and now a lot of this is going to come from my own personal wanting to know stuff or whatever. Even though we've had a consultation, it was very good uh, a couple of days ago. Um, as far as like um, where the tax uh, process is right now uh, with uh, many of the counties in Alabama. Uh, well, let's do this. Let, let's back up. Let's explain the, the basics of a tax lien, a tax deed and a tax certificate. The differences. I can do that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it um, given the fact that your audience wants to make money. So okay. Gonna, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's always keep that in mind. Yeah. yeah let's do that. <laughs> so All right. It's not going to be boring, dry law. What's the difference between the three types of tax, uh, you know, documents? Um, okay. If you're in, um, if you want to make money, if you want to make, uh, you know, three quarters of a percent, eight percent a year. If you want to make three quarters of a percent each month on your money, and you want that to be secured by real property, then you can invest in. Uh, tax liens, you can buy them from the state, you can buy them from a wholesaler, and what you've done is you've put a super lien on that property. For example, I had a client in just today, sweet woman, um, and she, she said, I've been living in this tax property, and I, I, I believe, just looking at I believe she's about 65 years old, sweet mm -hmm. woman, and she says, I've been living in this tax property for nine years, I, I bought it for taxes. And I, I moved in and I've just been living there for nine years. And just today or yesterday, she got a notice of foreclosure. Well, they're foreclosing on a fellow who lost it to ta in taxes to her. So what that means is if that fellow is actually going to foreclose on the property, he's going to have to pay her all of the taxes that she paid. Plus, because of when she bought it, back then it was 12% a year. So it's going to be, one, and that carries through. So it's going to be 1% interest a month. For nine years, so one hundred one hundred and eight months, <laughs> right? So it's 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 going to be quite a bit of money. That, wow! So so, it's, so it compounds. It it, 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 it that's a, that's a tricky question. It, it it depends on who the attorney on the other side is whether I compound it. 
<laughs> so, um, to, to make a long story short, um, so this woman, I was able to, to explain to her, no, you're not going to lose your house. At best, they're going to buy your house from, I mean, at worst, they're going to buy your house from you because they're going to have to pay that interest. And if you want to make 8, 8% interest a year, secure a better property, that's a great way to do it. Hmm. Buy one of those tax liens that are, there's thousands of tax liens that are at the state right now that you can buy. Hmm. Log in to the website, to the, the Alabama Department of Revenue website, apply for the property. Uh, you know, and Bob Sharple, you, you're, you're ready. And then when they send you a, a, a notice to tell you how much to pay, send them back a check. Or actually, they do it AFT now. You, you do an electronic transfer, and then you own the, you own the tax lien on that property. Mo, uh, quite a few of the ones at the state are deeds, so it's already a deed. So what that means wow. is they're not going to be able to just go into the courthouse and redeem it. And that's the difference between a deed and a certificate. Okay. A certificate is what gets issued at the sale. Mm-hmm. And this, the, this, I'm not talking about the, the system that we've used, we used for years. And you go to the courthouse steps and you bid on the, the, the taxes and you say, hey, there's $583 of taxes that are owed. I bid $1,583. And then mm. it gets bid until, and why are you bidding it up? Because the more you put in it, the more money you're making off that 1%. So people wanted to bid these things up. So they get bid up. You have this certificate. Now you've got the certificate and you're making your 1% interest a month. But for that person to redeem it, for the owner to redeem it, it's fairly simple. Go down to the courthouse, fill out some papers, do some steps, and then record it. And we handle that for people as well uh, when, when people want to redeem property and we do that frankly quite a bit for folks um, <clears throat> so if a person is living in the house you can pretty much bet that they're going to redeem that house so plan on making that interest that's what you're going to make on the other hand if nobody redeems the property for three years on the third anniversary it becomes a deed well mm-hmm. now the they can no longer just go down to the courthouse, fill some papers, do, do some steps, and redeem it. Now, pretty much, they have to sue you. Well, Ty, nobody wants to go to court. So mm-hmm. people generally, unless they are just you know stubborn or obstinate or something, people generally will say, well, look, rather than us having to go to court, it's going to cost me you know $3,500 to sue you. How about if we split that? I'll give you $1,700 over what I owe you if you'll just mm-hmm. give me my property back. So, you know, you just increased your interest rate by, by a pretty high percent, you know, so you just made a lot of money um, off of that, you know, $700 that you paid for the deed in the first case, first place. You know, you, you paid another 700 the next year, you paid another 700 the next year, and now you're going to get a $1,700 bonus on top of the interest. And a lot of them settle that way. Because you're not, technically, you're not even really redeeming the property unless you get a redemption deed. Really, what you're doing is you're buying the property back from that investor. Mm. Once it's a deed, wow. pretty much you're buying a property back. It, it's, it's not mm. really a redemption. I mean, you could call it that. Um, but, um, and that's why uh, uh, if, if the person argues with you and they say, well, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not paying the, 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 the I'm not paying you $1,700. I, I only want to pay what I owe. Well, okay. There's another way that you can make money by having invested in that deed. Um, if you handle it right, now they have to pay your attorney fees as well as their attorney fees. So now it's going to cost them seven grand. Wow. To do this. Plus, they're going to have to pay you for any insurance that you put on the property. Plus interest. Mm-hmm. Plus any, any, any like if, if the... If the property was vacant and you repaired the steps, they have to pay you back for repairing the steps as well as the interest on that money. So, like I said, um, if you want to make, if you just want to make interest, this is a great way to make interest. If you want to make more money, well, then you do repairs on the property. If you want to own the property, you can also own the property. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you're buying vacant vacant property, property with a with a residential structure on it that's that nobody is at. I've seen people, uh, here's a good example, Ty, and this is probably the most exciting thing that I've seen happen. Um, uh, mortgage company sent a letter, a notice of foreclosure to a bot, to the owner of the property. Uh, the owner of the property said fine and left. He moved out of the house. Well, mm-hmm. now 
you know, now the bank no longer has that escrow money to pay the taxes, so they stop paying the taxes. Mm-hmm. So the client buys the taxes with a certificate now, just, just bought a certificate at the next year's sale, yeah. goes to the house, realizes that the door and the, the, the back door is open on the porch, and yeah. it looks like people have been going in and out. Uh, so he goes in, he checks out the place, does fifteen hundred dollars worth of renovations, and puts a renter in there for fifteen hundred dollars a month. Mm-hmm. That was six years ago. He's still collecting rent on that property. Wow. Okay, so it's in a tax deed status now, right? It would have That's to. That's right. Be. Because it's, and now, because uh, for certain technical reasons, even if they sue him, they may not be able to get it back from him. But if they do sue him. They can't get that rent money. That rent money's his. Yeah. But all the money that he put, like if he had to fix the air conditioner, if he had to, to replace that porch on the back because it was dangerous, any of those things, they got to pay him for that too. Do you have to go record those repairs uh, so the county has track of it and they'll have actual record if it, if it comes to that? Do you have to, each time you do something, you have to go record it? You do not. What you do want to do is take pictures and have your receipts from the contractors and the materials that you bought. Okay. But you don't have to report it to anybody. It'll only come okay. up if somebody tries to redeem. Okay, so going back to the lady with the nine years, so she had a tax certificate or a tax deed, or um, I wasn't. Um, who, who tried to foreclose on her? Is I guess what I'm asking. The previous so owner, the, or well, for the first three years, it was a tax certificate. Okay. Then it became a deed. And okay. then she lived there for six years as with it being a deed. Now think okay. about all the maintenance she had to do on the house in those nine years. She probably had mm-hmm. to replace them. She probably had to do some painting and lots of things. So when she moved in, the reason why it went tax delinquent is because when she bought, uh, when uh, the, the house had sold the year before with a mortgage. Oh, okay. An investor bought it with a mortgage and, and planned to rent it, but then didn't take any actions. Well, mm-hmm. the, the problem is that when he didn't pay his taxes, that put that property up. She followed all the rules. She made sure that the property was abandoned. She sent him a letter saying, hey, look, I have this tax. And she did all the things right and and eventually just moved in. So the, the foreclosure letter was letting her know that the mortgage company, after nine years, wants to foreclose okay. on the, guy, the investor. Well, okay. here's the thing. When you, it's just like a sub two. When you mm-hmm. move into a tax lien property, you don't you don't become liable for the mortgage. Yes, okay, they might foreclose and, and take the property back, just like on a sub two. But they mm-hmm. they can't make you pay that. You have no personal responsibility to pay that that lien. Back. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, the, All right. Really All right. quickly, let me wrap up tax liens. Okay. okay. All right. There's a there's a new system which is going through Alabama. It's not as good for investors, um, and it's called the bid down system, and it's all online. And what investors do is is they will bid uh, on the interest rate. It starts at eight percent, and they bid the interest rate down. Typically, in Shelby, uh, Jefferson, um, all of the, the the southern counties, if the value, if the property has a lot of value, it gets bid down to zero almost every time. So you're not going to be making interest on those. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it's created a market for predators for these big companies from out of state to come in, buy those house, buy those tax liens. Then they sit for three years and and they're not allowed to take possession of the house with this new system. So they wait for three years and then they wait until the person goes on vacation or something. And then they file a, a, a foreclosure with the court and hope that the person doesn't answer, and then the court will foreclose on that lien and give them the house. And the problem with that is that uh, we, we, this was the first year in any county that that could happen. Shelby County was the, first, was the first, and there were only 33 properties that had not been redeemed yet this year, mm-hmm. you know, when it came time for the foreclosures. So mm-hmm. if if somebody wanted to foreclose on them, it's, it's, it's probably unconstitutional, it hasn't been, nobody's fought it yet, but that's a government taking, taking of the property, um, and they have to follow a lot of rules for a government taking, because the government's taking it and giving it to the investor. So, uh, again, what I'm saying is I don't think that that's going to be the best way for folks to make money, because your money has to sit there for three years, the house could burn in that time, and there's nothing you can do about it. 
you're not supposed to go on the property, uh, you're going to be probably getting letters from the county saying the weeds are growing up, and then there's going to be fines against the property, but you, by law, you don't have a right to go onto the property and cut the grass. So for the new system, it's really only good for very large companies who are trying to take advantage of little old ladies that didn't understand what was going on. Now, that's, that's my opinion. You know, I'm sure that there's somebody out there that would say that there's something good about this new system. I don't know what it is. So with the new system, and um, uh, I think a lot of other uh, states operate similar to this. So with the new system, it's not going to be a tax certificate. It's going to go into a tax lien status off the top. And people will have to bid on it, if I understand you correctly. That's right. And they changed the name to tax lien certificate instead of okay. tax certificate. Uh, just okay. to distinguish them, there's a new code section, 410-180 and, and on. That's what the new code section is for the new way of doing it. Um, but again, um, like I said, it, it's... It's just not the best. It's just not the best. The way for investors, uh, you, you talking to me the other day, I realized I was, that you're a pretty sophisticated investor in, in real property. So a guy like you, the way you would make money is by either buying those tax certificates from the state or buying them from a wholesaler. Mm -hmm. And if you get them from the wholesaler, you do have to pay a premium. Don't get me wrong. They're in, they're in it to make money. But you shouldn't yeah. be paying a whole lot of money, you know, mm -hmm. premium on that. You know, um, so, um, oh, and, and listen, there's two resources I want to mention to you. Okay. The first resource is there, there's a company. There's a company called USTLA, the United States Tax Lien Association. I'm not affiliated with them, but they are nationwide. And they're used to dealing with that new system. Um, and then the other organization I want to mention is the Alabama Tax Lien Association. The okay. Alabama Tax Lien Association has monthly meetings in uh, Jefferson County, and it's, it's local investors, it's California investors, it's across the country. And uh, the Alabama Tax Lien Association simply gets together to talk about how to make money with taxes. Okay. All right. Um, well, let me ask you this. Um, so would it, would it still be the same potential opportunity if uh, someone didn't pay the taxes? It goes into a, ta a tax lien certificate now in that status that... Um, we know there's an issue there. Um, okay, even if you didn't buy, if me as an investor didn't buy the tax lien certificate and someone else did, would it still be an option to try to reach out to that particular person that has the redeemable rights, uh, which is, I guess, the owner technically of the property to see if they would still sell the property? Because it, not always, sometimes, like I say, some people, sometimes people just forget or whatever they may live out of state and just you know miss the notices uh but it may be a situation where hey i just don't have the money anymore this property i'm done with it so would it still be an option to reach out to them directly to get those redeemable rights to maybe get them the quick claim deed and then you go redeem the uh the tlc the tax lien certificate or am i thinking Ty, coincidentally um there is another very sophisticated investor that I deal with, and she just left my office about two hours ago. We spent about an hour talking about her investments, and one of the things that she just did is exactly what you said. The fellow who owned the property died. So she went and found, she actually had to draw out the family tree because he died, his parents were dead, there were no, he had no children, and you, wow. you can figure this out. Yeah, I know. The law says that the way it goes is it goes down then up. Well, there was nowhere up to go. Now it goes over. So she found a stepsister and a half brother, no, a stepsister and a, an adopted brother. Mm -hmm. And she went to those two people and she said, Hey, look, um, I, I want to fix this house up. Your brother's house is falling to pieces. I want to fix it up. If you'll quit claiming this property to me, I'll be able to redeem it. And that's exactly what she did. She used those quick claim deeds and she went and redeemed that property. And she fixed it okay. up. And she's renting it now. All right. All right. So, so uh, just to be clear, so the tax lien certificate, as they're calling it, so that that still allow you to do it because the person can redeem at any point, right? Um, it just have to have to just pay whatever fees are associated with it or whatever or whatever interest is applied. Okay, so in, in now uh, in that situation where those the only two heirs that they could target or those the only two heirs that are needed, I, I, just to clear that up. Normally, I ask. Normally, the the title companies ask for three, 
airship affidavits and you know that because what you have to do is you have to have somebody attest that you know yeah the guy died and i knew him and his air and you know to attest to the whole air thing and we call that air property by the way um mm -hmm. i don't know if you know sheila smith but she um she has a a lot of folks that she works with and we do air we fix air property for them you know mm -hmm. grandma died and left it to daughter uh, you know, left it to grand to mom. Mom passed away. Left it to daughter, but there was never any deeds. There was never any wills. Nothing like that. So we we, we figure out how to clear up those deeds so that daughter can now sell it, or, okay. or maybe she can make a loan on it, or you know whatever. But um, these airship deeds, you normally need three. In this particular case, we only found two surviving relatives. Hmm. Okay, so if there's seven kids, let's just use this example. If I can get three of them to agree, we can. Uh, you can make it happen. Or if if it's known seven, you got to reach all seven. Well, if you I, do, all you need is one. Really? And then you then you can redeem it. But remember, you're redeeming it back into the owner's name. I got you. So, so if if somebody's deeded it to you, if one of those seven is deeded it to you, now you've deeded it back into the person who died. You've deeded it back into their name. And you only own one seventh of the property. I got you. So okay. we're so that's, 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 that's what. I'm, yeah, I'm just trying to make sure that okay, because you say you only need three. I was I was trying to make sure that even though you you know it's seven, you only need three to get a hundred percent ownership. That's what I was trying to make sure that I wasn't thinking right. wrong in that. What I meant to say was in those affidavits. You, you need three okay. of the affidavits, but. Um, we were only able to get a couple of the heirs to sign the deeds, the, the two that lived in Alabama. Everybody else is out of state. So mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're using the, the, the rights that my client does have to sue to quiet the title against everybody else who may have a claim. Okay. All right. Okay. So if you could explain. Those people yeah. for their part, but, you know. We need to get it done, so we're we're having to sue them because they wouldn't just play honest. Okay, so when you uh, explain quiet the title, uh, quiet title, just explain that. Sure. So um, there are lots of sorts of what we call encumbrances on on a title. For example, if a person um, has an IRS lien levied against them, that IRS lien goes against all the real property they own. Mm -hmm. So you, you know you're gonna have to deal with that. So if you if there's a sewer bill that wasn't paid and there was a sewer lien put on the property five years ago, we got the water on now, but there's a sewer lien against the property sitting there earning interest. That's an encumbrance on the property. Um, a, a judgment lien is an encumbrance on the property. There's lots of different encumbrances that could cloud the title, and that's the phrase we use. We say it's the title is clouded. In my firm, we first try to clear the title, and when I say clear the title. What I mean is we try to do it without going to court. Okay. If we can find the, the people and say, hey, you know, can we pay you this much and would you release your lien? You know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Now, the sewer company won't do that. They don't play. They will only accept everything that's owed full stop. I mean, they're, they're <laughs> the only entity that we've never been able to negotiate with. We've wow. been able to get IRS liens dropped, Medicaid liens dropped. We've been able to get um, personal loans that were secured by the property dropped. All, all these things. Well, if we can't get them to drop, if we can't get them to get the title clear, then we quiet those clouds. We quiet the title. And what that means is you go to the court and a judge says, all these other interests that are out there are, are void. So the only person with any interest is you. And that quiet title is actually better than a warranty deed because wow. you know, I mean, it, it excludes everything. You know, mm -hmm. so you get that quiet title and um, you throw a quiet title action to the circuit court in your county where the property lies. And we do this all over the state. My firm files uh, from Baldwin County to Madison County. Um, mm -hmm. That's pretty much as far north, I think, as we've gone. But um, so we like I said, we, we do these quiet titles for for clients all over the state. For example, uh, if, if somebody buys a property out of foreclosure. That's a, that's another investment strategy that people in Alabama like to use. Go to the courthouse steps, bid on the property, buy it out, of, you know, buy it out of the foreclosure. But the guy who used to own it still lives there. How do you get rid of him? Well, you have to file an ejectment action. 
and we mm-hmm. do that. For um, so uh, define, the, define inject injectment versus eviction. Yeah, that's a good point, Ty. Um, if you have a lease, even if it's a verbal lease, even if it's an oral lease, you evict. Be- and you do that in the district court, and it costs a little bit less and takes a little bit less time. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a lease and the person is there for because they used to own it, because they just moved in and they're squatting or, or whatever, um, you must eject them in circuit court with a motion with a, a complaint for ejectment. And ejectment, I'll be candid with you, it, it costs about three times as much and it takes three times as long. So an ejectment is someone that uh, a foreclosure has been uh, completed and now you have to remove them or it doesn't have to actually be a, a foreclosure to be an ejectment? Well, it, that's just one example of when you would need to okay. eject someone. Okay. Um, All if, right. if a person is in the, in the property or on the property and you don't have a lease, in order to legally get them off, you have to file yep. an ejectment and get a judge to exactly. order. And from that point forward, it looks a lot like eviction. Sheriff comes out there, um, you know, and, and sets the stuff out. And that's what we call it, is a set out. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Everything gets set out on the, 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 the sidewalk, unless they self-evict or self-eject, and they, they get out of there before the sheriff comes, which is, you know, that's what I would do. Okay. All right. Uh, wow. Oh, man. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, okay. So... Um, uh, just back on the air, probably one a month. So, if, if there were seven kids in the example I gave you before, if um, I don't know. So, if say if it was just one of the heirs trying to get ownership of it, you still would have to legally through the quiet title process reach out to each one of those and wait till they respond back. Now, if one of them said no, I'm I'm not selling. That's pretty much the end of it. Yeah, because no, you, you got to get everybody to agree. Um, no. That, that, well, Let's say that, that seven heirs, um, so that the, the owner of the property died without a will. So one thing you can do is, is you can go and you can get an affidavit from three different people that says, I knew Ty. I knew Ty had, one, had seven heirs, but I also know that Ty wanted this house to go to his first daughter, Joni. Ooh. And then wow. you write that up as an affidavit. You get it notarized. You file it with the court, I'm um, it with the probate court into you know, the land records. Then you go to the circuit court and you, you quiet the title based on that. And if any mm-hmm. one of those seven heirs wants to fight you, I'm sorry, any of the six heirs wants to fight you, well, then they would come back and they would show up in court and they would fight you and say, well, I don't think that that affidavit is true or, or whatever their argument is. It's trying to say that you don't own that property. And the judge is either going to rule that you do or you don't. How will they know about it? They have to be notified. Each, all six of those have to be an attempt to notify them has to be made or you just have to advertise it or what? You have to notify every every person who has an interest in the property. So if you know that there's six other heirs, then you would have to have all six served. Now, the way we typically get around that, because we want to reduce the time and the cost on our clients as much as possible, Stanley and Associates, we go and we will find those heirs. We will give them a deed and say, your brother's trying to quiet the title on this property. If you'll sign this deed, we won't have to sue you. And sometimes they <laughs> say, well, I want a thousand bucks. And we say, yeah. well, he only said we could give you 500, you know, or whatever it okay. is, whatever our guidance is. And then they sign, okay. we notarize it, we record the deed, and then that one we don't have to sue. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the uh, power of uh, subject two. Uh, subject to existing finance that's what it's short for and uh and and that process if you could explain it which uh more people will be more familiar with that probably watching than the tax stuff but if you could explain that briefly so that property that we were talking about that had the tax lien on it some mm-hmm. guy bought the property and made a mortgage on it right then and then let's say that he paid the mortgage for five years so he's got some equity in it, and during and just for using round numbers, let's say he he, he has a, he took a loan for twenty five thousand dollars, mm-hmm. and now the house has actually gone up in value. It's just, it's actually now going to be worth fifty thousand dollars, only if you fix it up. So, okay. an investor goes up to this fellow and says, "Hey, look, you you got a lien 
that's you still gonna have to pay about twenty grand. That's what's left owed on that that note you made. So it's right now this property has this mortgage on it, it's about twenty five grand. Um, but I can see that that you really need to sell it, and you're not gonna be able to sell it because there's something wrong. Uh, the septic tank is bad. But you don't yeah. have the five grand to replace the septic tank. Yeah. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you ten thousand dollars for your interest. Mm -hmm. You sell me the property with a warranty deed, with the exception being subject to existing financing loan, thus and such, recorded as instrument, this and that, in the Jefferson County Probate Courthouse. Okay. So it says mm -hmm. it right on the deed, box subject to. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, the fellow who lived in the house, he's got his ten grand, and he leaves. Mm -hmm. The investor has a house that he just bought for $10,000. He does the $5,000 worth of repairs, so now he's got $15,000 in it. But he still owes that mortgage of $20,000 because he bought it subject to the mortgage. Now, candidly, he can walk away if he wants. He did not assume that mortgage. So and that, in law school, those are the two terms we, we, we learn, subject to the mortgage or assume the mortgage. Because if he didn't assume the mortgage, he's not personally liable for that mortgage. They might be able to foreclose and take the house, but they can't make him pay the money. Mm -hmm. So let's say that that fella now, he says, well, I've got $15,000 in this house. There's a $20,000 mortgage. I can sell it for fifty five. So he mm -hmm. sells that house for $55,000. The first thing he does is he pays that $20,000 mortgage off. Then he pays himself back the $15,000. Then he keeps the fifty, the twenty thousand that he just made. Mm -hmm. So he bought it subject to the mortgage. He made the mortgage payments for six months while he worked on the house. Then, when he sold it at the closing table, he paid off that note, the existing note, the existing mortgage. Wow. Um, now I know they have the due on sale clause. If you could explain that, all I guess all mortgages have that in there now. What's the percentage? I know you probably don't have a real number, but what do you think that the well, number one, explain it and then give it like a percentage on how, how often that may even happen. Sure. Ty. What you're talking about is the bank loaned the money to this guy, you know, mm -hmm. so he wants that guy to make the payments. But right. he sold the house to the other guy. Now the other guy's making the payments. Mm -hmm. The contract, the mortgage contract that was recorded, has a lot of clauses, 16 pages probably is how big this document is. Mm -hmm. And one of those clauses is the one you mentioned, the the do on sale or, or they different phrases. But what it says is if you um, sell or convey or encumber any part of this property or, you know, in other words, if you do anything to the ownership of this property, if we want to, we can call the note in and make it do all right now. Yeah, call the note. Um, depending on the economic environment, a, a bank would might consider doing that. But mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, we all know banks are not in the business of owning houses. Lenders are in the business of lending money and collecting the interest and then lending money and, and you know, creating loans and selling them and all that. They, they don't want to actually ever touch the dirt. They don't want to actually touch the real property. And Lord yeah. forbid, they don't want to actually own it. So they don't yeah, want they, to close it. <laughs> it just happens out of uh, circumstance, out of just, just yeah, part of going to the yeah. That's just my yeah. out to make sure you give me the money and the interest, which mm -hmm. is what I want. So... Yeah. Um, so th put yourself in the bank's position or the lender's position, the mortgage owner, whoever. If they're getting the money every month, why would they foreclose on the house? Yeah. It, it just doesn't make sense why they would do it. Now, there is an exception. The VA, VA loans, they, they have to foreclose. If, 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 a, if the veteran moves out, yeah. he, you know, he, they, they have to foreclose. But apart mm -hmm. from that, it's, it's, not a, it's not against the law to do it. It, it's just a clause in the in the mortgage that gives the, the mortgage company the right to accelerate the mortgage and, and make it so that you would have to pay the, the mortgage. Sometimes it's written as though it would be a breach, which means they would have to give you the notice of the breach and they would have to to make, you know do all the the, the, uh, the steps before they did a, a non judicial foreclosure and then go to the courthouse steps and you know. But oftentimes it's a due on sale, so that it's just automatically accelerated and that saves them a couple months. Okay. All right, let's get into uh, wraparound mortgages. Um, if you could explain uh, how that works, um, that the first time I ever heard that term was um, do, do you uh, okay? Twelve years I've been doing it, twenty. So 
Do you do you uh, remember? I think he's I think he's passed now. But Don Williams, do you, do you know him? You ever heard of him? Yeah, man, no. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, he used to teach a class every every I think uh, once a month. Uh, every Saturday or whatever, it was about creative, um, uh, creative uh, financing uh, on deals or whatever. And one of the terms that he always used to use is um, he acquired a lot of properties through, I guess, the subject to or whatever. But and then he would do a wraparound mortgage on that. But if you could explain that uh, process. I'll be happy to explain it. But remember, I, I'm not giving any, any financial advice. I'm not qualified to give financial advice. I don't have the Understood. certificates or licenses to do financial mm -hmm. advice. We're just talking about the legal aspects of, of what, how, what that looks like and how that would be. I would never advise somebody whether to do this or not. Um, Stanley Associates does do closings, and we'll do wraparound closings. We'll do, uh, and, and that's something I need to warn you about, too. If you're doing a, a land deal, show the land the respect and show yourself the respect of hiring an attorney to do the closing. In Alabama, uh, it must be an attorney doing the closing. If it's not an attorney doing the closing, it's, mm -hmm. it's wrong. It's potentially illegal for whoever did the closing, and you're putting yourself in a lot of risk because there's a reason why we had to get our licenses. It's so you can sue us. So if we mm -hmm. do something wrong, you can come back on us. You know, mm -hmm. if, if we did the closing wrong on you, you can't okay. do that if the person's not an attorney. Plus, okay. um, I've seen. I'll say this. Virtually every deed that I see that is not recorded by an attorney has a flaw in it. It, oh, it wow. could possibly be void because of the flaw. I'll give you an example. I've seen uh, I've seen quit claim deeds that they thought they were quit claim deeds, but they yeah. use words of conveyance. So the effect is they actually sold the property even though they thought they were doing a quit claim deed. And that implied that they had a fee interest and now they're going to have to defend that property. Mm. You, you know, they could either be yeah. sued by their buyer, but the point is that make sure that if you're dry, if you're drafting any kind of a legal document, make sure that an attorney does it. That's that's the yeah. correct answer. Okay. All right. All right. So with a wraparound mortgage, here's the way that goes. And as I said, uh, attorney Scruggs does our closings, and, and um, I just happened to see a, an email regarding a, a wraparound mortgage that she's preparing for for a guy in um, Montgomery. And mm -hmm. what the guy did is. Uh, he found a good deal on a piece of property. The the person who lived there um, didn't want to keep living there. There was some equity in the property. And so she, he said to the, 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 the person who uh, was living in it, hey, look, I'll buy this property from you sub two. And she said, that sounds great. Let's do that. Otherwise, I'm going to be foreclosed on. My credit's going to be wrecked. And you're going to save me here because you're going to be making the payments. And so he said, Fantastic. So we're doing the closing on that deal. And then he came to us and he said, listen, I've already got a buyer for the property. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, that's neat. I mean, that's really neat. So who's financing that? He said, because you can't do a double closing if there's a bank involved. Okay. A bank involved, uh, the law yeah. says you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, who's financing it? He said, I am. I said, so you're doing, he said, and I'm not paying off the first mortgage. I said, all right, so, you're going to collect the rent, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the mortgage money from your buyer at your amount you sold it for, $20,000 more than he, he had to pay to the bank. And the interest rate is two points higher than the interest rate with the bank. Mm. So you're going to take that. And I want to say that the just principal and interest was $600. Mm -hmm. So you're going to take that money from them, the $600 each month, then you're going to turn around and you're going to pay the note that you bought sub two, and that's only $400 a month. So you're going to collect the 600 and pay the 400 and you don't have to do anything else. He said, yep, that's the plan. That is a wraparound mortgage. Okay. Did he do it? Uh, you might've said that he did it at a higher interest rate than what the. We're, we're, we're okay. writing that, um, we're writing that uh, mortgage up and it's going to be 2% two, uh, higher than what the, the, uh, the existing mortgage is. And it's, I want to say it's like twenty grand higher than what the um, the uh, than what was owed on the note. Okay, in a cash sale, we uh, we mentioned the other day when we have we were having our consultation with you were having your consultation with me about transactional funding. Um, like you were just saying that a lot of people use it in a double closed situation, um, but um, 
only if um well yeah, just explain it you know, how that actually works and i know you said you had a source that actually does that sometimes for you all if if if, if the uh deal permits it well absolutely these are pretty these pretty have pretty much these have to be high margin deals and mm -hmm. again this is a very sophisticated thing um stanley associates uh does these kinds of closings however um we make sure that we follow all the rules for, you know not just the laws in Alabama, but, but the, you know, all the rules about the interest rates and um, uh, how, whether it has to be a cash on the table closing and all that. Well, in some closings, real money has to be on the table. So let's say I'm going to use $100,000 as a round number. Let's say mm -hmm. that there's a, there's a loan out there for $100,000. And we have a person in the middle who bought the property and he's selling the property to someone else, obviously for a higher number. Mm -hmm. He can't close both of them at the same time because that's a double close. And what that would mean is we used the bank's money, we used their loan to go through that guy in the middle who bought it. And then the next guy got the money. You can't do that. The guy mm -hmm. in the middle has to come in with the money. He has to pay the money, put it down. And so transactional mm -hmm. funding is that <clears throat> the the money to pay off that loan mm -hmm. is deposited into our escrow account. You know, mm -hmm. the escrow account that the firm has for our clients. So that mm -hmm. money that is going to be used to pay off that loan has to be in the account first before mm -hmm. we can close. Mm -hmm. And we close now, the mortgage has been paid, if you think about it, because we've already got that money. We're ready to send yeah. the information and everything, mm -hmm. and it's, it's going to be paid. And then the new buyer, he pays cash, and what he does is he pays that into escrow. Mm -hmm. And then when the transaction is over, we disperse the funds. Okay. So you see, the bank was never ripped off. The bank always... Um, they were paid off before that transaction took place. Mm -hmm. Well, where'd that money come from? Most wholesalers don't have that kind of money just hanging around, mm -hmm. you know? So transactional funding is where a, 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 an investor will say to you, um, I will fund that $100,000. I will deposit that cash into the account and um, that will be a loan to you you know, to the wholesaler to make this deal happen so that you can actually have a, a, a closing that would look a lot like a, a double closing, you know, because there, there's two things happening at the same time, but it's legal because the money was paid. Well, they don't okay. want to, they're not doing that for cheap because they know first there's two things. Not a lot of people have a hundred thousand dollars that they can just loan you for two days or, or typically it winds up being a few, more than a few days because you know, mm -hmm. The money has to be there before we're going to do the closing. And so, you know, it has to be escrowed. So the money has to come in and not a lot of people have the kind of money to let it just sit there. Mm -hmm. And they also know that. So, so my point is it's scarce. So you're going to have a hard time finding somebody to loan that money to you. I got you. And it, so they, they want to be paid for it. They're going okay. to ask some pretty high percentages for that money for those week or however long it is. And whatever you contract with that uh, transactional lender is what you contract with that transactional lender for that money. Correct. Okay. And you have, to have a, you have to have a fairly sophisticated closing agent to make sure that everything is done properly and legally to meet, meet all the bank requirements and everything like that. And right. again, let me get my company here. Um, it's Stanley Associates. We're on Facebook. We're in Irondale. We, uh, we have an office in Bessemer. Uh, we operate all over the, the state. If you want to call us to, um, if you have a, a real estate or, or a contracts issue that you want to discuss, uh, 205-451-4196, or um, you can go to the website and you'll see our emails, or you can go to Facebook and you can find us there. Mr. Stanley, man, I, I really uh, appreciate you uh, sharing this knowledge. I hope we can definitely do this again. Of course, you know you'll be hearing from me more than probably what you want. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we definitely uh, 
uh, appreciate all the knowledge. And, uh, man, you know, I was just so blown away when we had our consultation on Monday on the properties that we're working on. And, um, yeah, to be hearing more from it from uh, Greg in the future, guys. Uh, so you have his contact information doing in the business in Alabama. You, uh, you're watching this. You're probably trying to do this real estate thing in uh, uh, different ways than a lot of other people are doing it out there. And so uh, this is an opportunity to uh, work with someone that can make all of this happen. So, again, we appreciate Greg for uh, sharing his knowledge. And uh, as I always like to say, guys, we'll see you on the flip side. Excellent. Text me and I'll text you back. Text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. Tick tock, you don't stop. I will help you make your paper stack. Where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Where you at now? 205 964 Yep, yep. 205 964 You know.